<laughs> Hello, and welcome to Geeking Out About the Geek, a special bonus episode of Tabletop Bellhop Live. Coming to you from Hamilton, I'm Sean, and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions, and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi to everyone chatting in the lobby here on Twitch. It's really encouraging to see the support we've been getting here. So much support. Growing support. Support everywhere. Here at Tabletop Bellhop, we answer your game and game night questions. Each week, I publish an Ask the Bellhop article over at TabletopBellhop.com, which is followed up by an episode of our podcast, Tabletop Bellhop Live. We normally record Tabletop Bellhop Live every Wednesday at 9.30 p.m. Eastern, and we welcome you to join us at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop and take part in the lobby, our live chat. Now, what you're watching or listening to right now is a special bonus episode. These episodes are usually in addition to our regular episodes, but may also sometimes replace them. Bonus content is recorded, but the release of it on our various channels won't always be planned at the time of recording. Don't worry, though. If you're subscribed, you'll get it delivered right to you. You are subscribed, right? I hope so. These bonus episodes will be something different and won't follow our usual format. In general, we won't be doing a week in review, and we're probably going to be talking about something other than one of your questions. As an example, check out our first guest check-in episode, where we interview Phil Vecchione about his new RPG, Hydro Hacker Operatives. And the more bonus episodes we record, the more shout-outs Phil gets. <laughs> Today, uh, we'd like to invite you to the break room, where Sean and I will be talking about the number one source for board game information on the internet. That is BoardGameGeek.com. We're always looking for your comments and suggestions. If you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to Mo at TabletopBellhop.com or Sean at TabletopBellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. You can also contact us all over social media. Just look for Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Every Wednesday, we'll be sending out an email recapping all of the content we've released the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, previews, giveaways, anything else we create. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com webpage and you will find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. Welcome to the break room, where the bellhop and I sit down, grab a coffee, and chat about something that's important to the gaming hobby. Uh, this is just an informal chat about something we care about that we thought you, our viewers and listeners, would be interested in hearing our opinion on. Today's topic, BoardGameGeek.com. So, according to BoardGameGeek itself... It calls itself a board game database, a collection or a catalog of data and information on traditional board games. The game information recorded there is intended for posterity, prosperity, prosterity. I did say it right the first time. Prosterity, not prosperity. Is it? No, maybe it's posterity. Posterity is. I think I got it right the first time, and then I screwed myself up. Uh, it's intended for posterity, historical research, and user contributed ratings. All the information within the database was meticulously and voluntarily entered on a game-by-game -game basis by their user base. You guys, me, Sean, Deanna, I don't know. I don't think Sean and Dee have actually added anything. But the board game people, the people who use the site. Uh, it is noted that this, all this information is freely offered through flexible queries and data mining. In other words, search our site. Find more stuff. Yes, that is pretty much it. Um, it is a giant database. It looks like a giant database. It's about as fun to use as a giant database. Just realize that's what it is. And 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 much like a giant database that was created in the yeah late nineties, early two thousands. Um, yeah. It they they the content is constantly evolving. The way of displaying that content. Not so much. Yeah. Uh, welcome, Jeff, to our chat. 
Jeff, the DCC Master GM at our Extra Life this last weekend, ran two games of DCC, one that started at 4 a.m., went till about 10 on Sunday. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for coming by. So, unlike our Kickstarter bonus episode where Sean and I were kind of butting heads and had some differing of opinion, uh, a lot of this is just going to be information on what Board Game Geek is for those of you who haven't been there. Because I'm sure if you haven't been there much, you went there and you were like, whoa, what is all this and how do I use it? So I wanted to start off with a bit of history. Now, Sean was right by saying uh, late 1990s because Board Game Geek was launched in January the year 2000. What I thought was interesting is this database was launched one year before Wikipedia existed and was considered one of the biggest databases of information on the web at the time. Now, it was originally started by a guy named Scott Alden. Everyone calls him Aldi. That's his board game geek username, Aldi, to rate and log his video games. And he called the site 3dgamegeek.com. Um... There's not a lot of information on it. It just, I guess, failed, and he got into hobby board games. So he made Board Game Geek uh, in January, year 2000. Uh, he added the forums in July 2000. So at this point, all you had was a list of games. Now you had a place to talk about games. Actual ratings weren't added until 2001. So the site was out for a full year before you could actually rate games. And at the same time, that was when you could create a collection. So you could say, hey, I own this game or I want this game and I could rate it. So you could get a list of all the games you own and how you rated them. Geek lists, which is a huge part of the site, were added in 2002. 2003, Aldi woke up and went, wait, I could be making money off this and started offering advertising. 2004, he added something called Geek Speak, and this just shows how complicated Board Game Geek is. I've been on there since 2002, and I have no idea what Geek Speak is. I honestly have no clue, but in 2004, it was a big deal that they launched Geek Speak. In 2005, they got involved in the convention scene and launched BGG.com, or better known as Board Game Geek Con. Uh, in 2006, Scott was now making enough money on bgg to quit his day job and do bgg full-time and at that time there was a massive site overhaul uh that's when he added all the wiki functionality that's when the site changed to instead of having gaming forums literally having a forum for every game on the site and you could have wikipedia pages and you can have guilds and a lot of other stuff in 2009 a site called geekdo.com went live. Anyone who's been around since then knows that was the really dumb name they gave RPG Geek when it launched. And I guess it was supposed to be Geekdo like a dojo and there was supposed to be some, I don't know, transcendent thing. And then sometime around then, whatever page I was reading that had the timeline, they stopped updating it. So I have no idea what happened from then on. I do know in 2015, they went, we're going to redesign the whole site. And they redesigned the whole site. Except when you go on the site, all that seems to have changed is the individual board game pages. Everything else looks the same as it did before then. So uh, I'm, actually, to... I'm actually on the uh, the Wayback Machine right now. Uh, oh, okay. From, from the year 2000, the uh, the Board Game Geek, uh, or the 3D, uh, 3dgamegeek.com. 3dgamegeek.com, yep. It's pretty close to indistinguishable. Uh, oh really? I wow. Mean, they, 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 the database isn't connected, so there's some. It's yeah. missing some data. But I mean, the colors have changed. It was it was green on blue back then, but that's about <laughs> there you it. Go. Yeah, <laughs> the, this the site the site shows its time. So yeah. that's that's all the information I have on the on the history of it. Somewhere in there, like I'm thinking, like by 2002, it was a big enough deal that I found it when I was looking for board game news. It became the one true resource for board game information on the internet. The RPG geek side never did quite as well, but it's still a fantastic site for resources on RPGs. There's enough other blogs and stuff out there with histories of different RPGs. I think that's what kept people away from it. He also then tried to bring the video game thing back into it by launching a part of the site called videogamegeek.com. I admit I've clicked on that like once or twice and went and like logged one play of one video game and kind of went, yeah, it looks like board game geek. I highly doubt that ever took off as like the newest because I don't see anyone talking about the video game geek ratings of the latest Fallout or the latest 
whatever. Everyone still talks about Metacritic and IGN and whatever, the video game sites. No one's using Video Game Geek, as far as I can tell. And if, but uh, we're Metacritic, here at main... if Metacritic isn't using them, then it really doesn't matter. Yeah, uh, exactly. <laughs> I don't think they do. Maybe you can check. Uh, but just to show how popular it is, in January 2008, they register 5 million visits every month. That's 5 million people using the site every month. That is insane. Like, that's a crazy amount of hits. Um, it's, 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 the big, it's the big bear. It, it is the website for board game information. And it's good at what it does. But it's really hard to use if you don't know what you're doing. Like I said, I started using the site around 2002. It might have been 2003. I created my login in 2002. I was able to see that. Um, 2002 is the year I launched the Windsor Gaming Resource. So at that point, I was heavy into forums and chatting on forums. And my web page at that time was a web portal, which you don't tend to see those anymore. It was a site you went to to go to other sites. So basically, it was a bunch of links to get more information. And what I did it for is I had five sources of board game news that I paid attention to at the time. Board Game Geek was one of them. Um, board Gaming News was another, another called Gaming News. And I was also into video games then. So I had a MMORPG.com and a Final Fantasy XI page because I was really heavy into that game at that time. And I had a bunch of RSS feeds that would slowly scroll down the WGR homepage. And from that, I ended up getting the information on Board Game Geek, and I started getting more and more information on the board games I wanted to play from that. Uh, board Game Geek is what got me to buy Settlers of Catan from the local game store, Hugen & Munin, and really got me back into modern games. Now, as you can see behind me, I was into board games long before that. Most of these Games Workshop games before behind me came out in the 80s and the early 90s. So I did play hobby games, but Board Game Geek got me into the Euro games. The There's a reason I wore my cube pusher shirt tonight because it fits it's it's the soulless euros the a very different style of game than say dark future adeptus titanicus and space hulk so i credit board game geek for broadening my horizons that way i don't know if sean's got much to say or <laughs> no i think we're, we're 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 covering through i mean this is just sort of the history in which you're uh, far more up okay. on than i am about this well i did my research on this time I, i'll admit it i have bunch of stuff copy pasted from board game geek in front of me or notes i made earlier today like i do like the site and i went uh, so, for you could eat sushi instead of reading my notes so <laughs> see that's all good i i, I think i could have done sushi instead too i, I actually I wish i would have read the notes it, it was I, I won't be returning to that sushi joint unfortunately oh ouch. yeah it was uh, ouch. yeah they, they couldn't keep their rice together to save their lives it was horrible oh, that's a bad sign non-sticky rice sushi yeah it's not good so going into board game geek so if you're there the first thing you're going to see is the front page. What a lot of people don't know and what is really good, and this is for a um, hardcore is the wrong term, but uh, a power user, whatever, someone who takes the time to learn the site, you can modify what you see on the front page. So what I should have did is logged out and hit refresh to see what it normally looks like because over the years I've modified it. So for me, it's very useful because it shows a bunch of stuff near the top of the page that I find very useful and stuff at the bottom. Now, a lot of this has to do with the fact that I dig RPG news. I consume a ridiculous amount of, sorry, RPG and board game, tabletop game media. I try to keep my finger on the pulse of the board game industry. So on my front page, you will see announcements, sponsored contests. This is mainly because I do the tabletop deals thing and contests generally mean free games. Plus I often enter myself to try to get games that look interesting. So announcements, sponsored contests, contest results. Then a section called the Geek Buzz. This is the games that are hot right now and the forums that are hot right now. The things that have received the most thumbs and geek gold. Thumbs and geek gold are your typical social media encouragement for posting, right? Thumbs up. I like what you posted. In this, you can actually give people uh, a cryptocurrency. It, they didn't call it that back in the day, but it really is. There's this thing called geek gold that you can change into real money. It's not worth much as far as real money is concerned. Like you have to give up a thousand geek gold for about a buck, but it is a real thing. And it's one of the things they instituted in 
I think it's 2005 or so, to encourage more people to put stuff in the database. So you at least get this little reward. Basically, all it does is the same thing as all your little cell phone apps. It gives you that little dopamine burst of, hey, look, I got some gold for putting this thing on there. It's not really worth anything. There are people that have Geek Gold contests and everything else. Oh, yeah, I kind of got off on Geek Gold. Didn't mean to do that. Some later topic. Uh, so the Geek Buzz. So what's hot? And it th uses an algorithm based on, again, thumbs and the amount of Geek Gold people have donated to different forum topics. What I like about the Geek Buzz is they'll give you forum topics from all over the site. So it may be about some weird, obscure game no one's heard of that all of a sudden everyone's talking about, or it could just be the newest side of the expansion. Like, you'll, you'll see both. Uh, latest news, obviously. Latest images. That one's not as useful to me as it used to be. I used to really dig liking seeing the um, images of games, but now, that back in 2002, seeing pictures of your game components before getting the game was cool. Nowadays, you can pretty much get those anywhere. That's one I should probably drop. Latest eBay auctions, because, well, I like to try to save money and I look for how to print games, so it just lists the latest stuff on, on eBay. Gone Cardboard, which is new games launched, like the second that like people have added them to Board Game Geek. So brand new games. Um, latest videos, latest forum posts, latest subdomain forums, latest geek lists, latest game forums, latest reviews. Now we're getting further down the page. I don't tend to scroll this far. Latest session reports, latest crowdfunding, latest blogs, then something called Board Game Geek Related, which is the off-topic stuff where people are talking anymore. It's mostly politics, I'll have to admit. Uh, politics, religion, favorite TV shows, Marvel Cinematic Universe, whatever. Uh, community, which is people talking about other people. The marketplace and buying and selling. I, That's that's my list. Of all that, generally, I open Board Game Geek and I click on a button that just shows me my latest subscribe topics and I don't even read anything on the homepage anymore. But so for years when I was trying to do more media, it was useful. So the uh, the default front page because I don't even have a login for for Board Game Geek is is actually pretty close to what you get. It's uh, announcement sponsored contest and contest results are the are the front and center. Yeah. Uh, gone court cardboard is under that, and then on the other okay, side. Yeah, so that's a little further up. And then on the other side, you get the Geek Buzz news and images. Um, so it looks like a lot of the stuff is the same, or I didn't bother modifying it. Yeah. So that's your front page. Now, at the top of the front page, you have pull-down menus with the major sections of the site. So the most useful one to the average user is going to be games. In there, you're going to find every board game ever published, a whole bunch that are in the works, and a bunch that will be published next month, and a bunch of vaporware that will never exist. It's That's where you can get your list of every game on the planet and it's ranking from one to whatever number games there are on the planet now, 50,000 or whatever that we're up to. I have no idea. It's probably 500,000 anymore. Uh, you can sort it by different things. You can look at your game collection and so on. You basically have a whole bunch of drop downs of information on games. They show the 102,483 next... games. There you go. I, I, if I average both my numbers, I think maybe I'm <laughs> close. Uh, up next is My Geek. So this is your profile section right and this is another one you can customize what shows here so it's your personal page it shows your geek gold it shows your micro badges you've collected your avatar your personal collection how many games you've rated your average rating you've given your hot games what you've been playing lately basically all the information you choose to put out to the public and the nice thing on board game geek is you can go totally anonymous and not put any of this public or you can put all of it public myself i want to share this stuff so it's all public if you want to see the games i own go on there look for gilvan blight which i'm not going to bother spilling out because i didn't make a new tabletop bellhop account because i've had this account since 2002 and you can see every game i own on there uh, next is the forums. The forums are huge. The forums are very hard to search. It's very hard to find the forum you want. It's one of the more in-depth parts of the site because there is literally a separate forum for every game, for every tag, for every genre, for every designer, every piece of data. Think object-oriented programming. Every capsule has its own forum. It's crazy. It is an insane amount of information. It's nuts. Now, the secret is to subscribe to the content you want to see. And then when you're bored, you browse to find new stuff to subscribe to. 
So if you see a hot new game show up in that hot list, you click on subscribe. And now anytime anyone posts on any of those forums, a little number shows up next to your username. You click on it and you get the list of the new forum entries. I subscribed for a while to every game I owned just because I figure I want to hear everything. Very quickly, I started unsubscribing from a bunch of them. Certain games I stayed subscribed to. So literally the only thing I do when I go on BoardGeek nowadays if I'm not looking for information on a specific game, I open Board Game Geek. I do this at least once a day. I go to my subscribe button. It usually says numbers between 80 and 250 because I consume a lot of board game media. I click on that and I go through quickly. A whole bunch, I just hit mark as red because I know what it is. So the forums are huge. Um, at one point, they thought there are a lot of board game and RPG bloggers out there. Why not give them a platform so they don't have to have their own blogs? I didn't get it. Like, Part of what I like about blogs is that it's not centralized. And back in the day, especially, you had the whole blog roles and you did blog circles. Well, they put blogs on Board Game Geek. Some people went nuts with it. Like there are reviewers who are only ever post reviews on blogs on Board Game Geek and get paid and get tons of review copies for it. Um, Stephen Bonacor of Stronghold Games will not send a review product out to anyone who does not have a blog on Board Game Geek because to him, that is someone talking direct to his customers because it's talking to the alpha gamers who are on Board Game Geek. And I kind of get it, but I don't want my blog on Board Game Geek because the other thing is you have to be exclusive. If you post on Board Game Geek, I can't then go post on Tabletop Bellhop. I can after some time and then I have to put a whole I, this was originally posted on Board Game Geek. Something I wasn't willing to do. Some people do it. There are blogs on Board Game Geek. Feel free to read them. They're just like any other blog. I also hate markup versus HTML, but that's there, a personal preference. There are preference. a lot of blogs on, on Board Game Geek. Oh, <laughs> yes. It is, it is. A lot of people took it seriously. Um, yeah. And, and there are it, people there with thousands of posts. Oh, yes. So, uh, yep. It's definitely a thing. It was a huge deal when it launched. Like People went nuts. They thought it was awesome. Uh, I tried it. 90, 98 pages of blogs, I, of, of different blogs, I believe. Different blog, Yeah, I don't doubt it. Um, I'm not sure. I can't. Uh, at a quick glance, it looks like some random number of, of lines per. So you're looking at something along the lines of 4,000 blogs? It's actually lower <laughs> than I would have thought, but... I mean, I'm, I'm guessing it's 98 pages, and I'm guessing there's somewhere along the lines of 40 per page. I can't, without, they didn't, they didn't number the list, so. I can't see it. I was looking to see if there's just, like, a blogs with a bracket number, like, you can look at for the games. No, it isn't there. But, yeah, I don't see it. But, anyway, there are blogs. I, not something I frequent often, but when searching for a game, often a Board Game Geek blog will come up. Um, next, something I do like better than blogs, something called Geekless. Uh, I don't even know what the original purpose was, if they meant it to be like, here's my top 10 in this or not, but you can create a geek list of anything. So people have created, you know, my wish list, my games I own, my favorite expansions, but the really useful ones are the ones that tend to be our type of blog topics or our podcast topics, like best two player games. When I was searching for best games to play on Halloween, multiple geek lists come up. What I find great about geek lists is you can subscribe to those too. So if you happen to find this geek list, that's like, especially for obscure things. So like sci-fi games that use an impulse system that aren't Star Trek, there's probably a geek list for that. And there's probably three games on it, and you could subscribe to that. And then when that fourth game comes out, you can get really excited with all the other people who are into sci-fi-based games that use impulse systems that aren't Star Trek. And be like, woo, we have another Starfleet Battles ripoff. This is awesome, right? It's They're neat. Geek the, lists are one geek, of my favorite things to find. The geek list equivalent uh, would be an IMDb list. So it's people, yes. who, you know, people who build up their movie list. You know, Favorite movies with actresses who are blonde or you know, yes. whatever. Um, I see it, it, some of the top great. ones, you know, the people who went to Spiel would list off all the games they played there. Or uh, mm -hmm. some people, uh, they have auctions, will do a list of all the games available on a certain auction. Uh, yes. You know, another top 20, another, you know, most obscure games, stuff like that. So yeah. very, very no, equivalent to IMDb. It, it's, it's one of, in my opinion, one of the best pieces of functionality in on the site. And the other thing you can do too is you can make your geek list so it's yours or you can make it open so other people can add to it. 
Uh, people do use them for contests all the time. It's one of the few things I use for my Geek Gold is they'll have games for Geek Golds, and they put a geek list, and you they, people auction off games using Geek Gold. And that's the one thing I'll use them for. And I know it's Steve D., who is in our chat. Hey, good to see you again, Steve. No, the 1,000 Geek Gold is about 10 bucks, can, or 10 bucks US, I guess it would be. So like I said, there is an actual value there. Um, up next is the Bazaar. There's two big parts of this. One is the Marketplace. Uh, it's worse than eBay. Everything we said the other day in our Kickstarter episode about eBay and Kickstarter saying we're just a platform, Board Game Geek's even worse. Like, they, they take zero responsibility. They don't even, like, they're just hands off. You guys have this forum. You do your own thing, and you police it yourselves. You have no protection there. It is 100% buyer beware. That said, you have a very, very dedicated, focused community who are all about games, trying to buy, sell, and trade them with each other, and the self-policing is fantastic. When a new guy shows up and puts up an unreasonable offer, remember how I said everything has a forum? As soon as someone launches a new page for sale, it becomes a forum where everyone can go comment. And immediately, people will jump in and point out, hey, buyer beware, notice this guy's new, notice he just created an account. It is a fantastically self-policed site, but realize Board Game Geek's going to do nothing for you if you spend $500 and don't get that new copy of Rising Sun, your SOL. Maybe you can try to go to small claims court or something, but there is no system whatsoever. There is a very basic feedback system. And while people geek gold people for and give thumbs for good transactions so very much buyer beware but man if you're looking for the best prices on games and you're not checking board game geek marketplace you're not shopping the best deals probably, like yes cool min probably something to stick to as an american though where you can go to court, uh, small claims court easily if there is a problem uh i i think outside of america you might want to have be even more buyer beware just because it's yeah. not as easy to uh, to have a, a legal option if uh, something goes wrong. Now, I bought a grand total of three games off the Board Game Geek Marketplace, and every time they have shown up in better shape than I expected. Like, I got games came sleeved with baggies, and I wasn't expecting any of that. Or a game showed up unpunched, and I thought I was buying a used game. Every transaction I've had is fantastic. The other thing, though, is pretty much a universal rule that as a buyer, you're going to pay shipping. That just everyone has adapted that. Whereas on a lot of sites, the the sellers are like, well, soak the shipping. It just everyone on Board Game Geeks, this seems to be the unwritten rule is the buyer pays shipping. And while most games are sold in the U.S. and shipping to Canada sucks. So that's the main reason I don't buy a lot there. So the other thing you will find in the bazaar is the geek store. So the geek store is very cool because Board Game Geeks, excuse me. Gets a lot of exclusive small print run expansions and tends to sell them for 3 to $5 each. So this is another. Be smart. If you go on eBay and you see uh, Terraforming Mars bonus card, for one, you could probably go get it at any local con. But f number two, go to Board Game Geek. You can probably get it for 3 to 5 bucks. And on eBay, it's probably going to go for like $200, which is ridiculous. They sell a ton of these. Like there's an expansion for Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunters. It costs $5 on the Board Game Geek store. The only reason I haven't bought it, though I should have two years ago, is I keep being told an expansion's going to come that'll have it in it. That expansion's finally here. But if I had just spent 5 bucks, I could have used that for two years from now. Uh, there, there are expansions for everything. Like Castles of Burgundy, I think there's eight different expansions. Now, these are all small. Like they're like con giveaways and promos or like two new tiles for a game or three more cards or two new pitchers for Dixit. They're not big boxed expansions, but the prices are extremely reasonable. It's very cool stuff that people tend to think is more exclusive than it is. Like they'll go on eBay and pay silly prices or noblenight.com. Check the Board Game Geek, Geek store first. They do sell a few full games as well, uh, including the Board Game Geek game. I've never played it. I've not heard good things. You would think when... That group puts a game together, it would be good. I, I'm so kind of surprised at the... some of those prices, though. I mean, I'm looking at like the start player marker upgrade for Terraforming Mars, ten bucks. Probably three or five. Oh, well, that one's high, yeah. And I mean, it's a nice mini. It's uh, it's basically the Mars rover in uh, two and a half okay. inch mini form. It looks really pretty, but two and a half, but ten bucks for a uh, ABS mini. That's just a, a start player token. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> that's probably not one I would but, pay but, for. All the cards, all the extra terraforming Mars card expansions are all like three bucks. Yeah, but 
three yeah yeah i think they're three bucks each yeah. which is awesome that that one it's like self-replicating robots or something that card is fantastic so those are the major categories and they're kind of across the top like when you log in you get drop down menus you kind of look at all that stuff over on the left is going to be one of the things if you're into cult of the new if you care about the new hotness what's everyone going nuts for that's where you want to look for is a section that calls the hotness this is again board game geek combines a bunch of stuff with the number of comments and the number of thumbs and everything and comes up with how a game is hot if you were trying to produce a game you want your game on that list bad sadly people will abuse the system to get it there the most common thing I have now seen on Kickstarters is for people to like, sub, and comment, and thumb on Board Game Geek to give people chances of winning stuff or to unlock stretch goals. People are playing the system. That's going to happen on a database like this. It's not going to be stopped, but the hotness is... It, it, if you want to see what's hot in the industry, it's the place to go. Like, you want to see. I, I honestly don't go there that often, but right now, Arkham Horror 3rd Edition, yep, you know what, based on the podcast I listen to, my Facebook feed, my Twitter feed, yes, everyone's talking about Arkham Horror 3rd Edition. And it's, Next been up one, there, it's been up there for weeks. Like, every time yeah. I've, I've looked at it recently, it's been Arkham Horror 3rd Edition. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. Uh, the second one, Discover Lands Unknown. Anyone know about this one? Bueller, Bueller. No, <laughs> everyone's heard of this. This is Fantasy Flight Games is using procedural generation so that every single person that buys a cup copy of Discover Lands Unknown gets a different board game than every other person in the world. It's brand new, something no one's ever done before. Reviews are starting to roll in. They seem pretty good. They, I, it's looking pretty good. Now, if you listen to The Secret Cabal, you know that Tony Topper hates this and thinks it's... Or no, it's Chris. Sorry, Chris from The Secret Cabal hates this and thinks it's the dumbest idea ever because what it is is the landscape is different every time and he'd be so mad if he bought a game and all he got was some stupid desert because who wants to play in a stupid desert? I don't know. Personally, I think it's a neat concept. I'm waiting to see reviews before I pick it up. And then it drops down. There's all these games. I'll admit the next one, I have no idea what that is. Tio Chichion, City of Gods. I have no it's, idea what uh, that is. It's on the hotness list from uh, Spiel, so I'm assuming it's brand new. Probably uh, brand new German game. It's, What's it's interesting, interesting, actually. It, it looks it looks sort of like a, 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 a meeple worker placement, but it's also got this um, uh, uh, Japanese uh, placement in a, in a tower of things. Um Mahjong. Yeah, Mahjong. Weird. It's like, oh, oh it's like the this, matching version Yeah, it's of got this strange, okay. strange matching Mahjong thing in the center of the board. I'm, I'm just looking at some pictures of it right now. Huh. But uh, it's, what uh, I it's, think's interesting. it's got an 8.1 rating. So Wow, that's good. What I like to see on that is games that stay for a long time. So, like, I'm scrolling down there and I see Azul. Like, Azul's been out for a long time. I see Concordia. Like, Concordia, that's an older game. To still be that hot, that's kind of cool. Um, those are the two that really caught my eye that were still there. Root, I knew was hot. I thought it'd be higher up, and so on. What's neat that most people don't do is you can actually sort it by people, so you can see who the hot designers are right now. You can also sort it by company to see who's hot, who's talking about which company right now. So, again, as board name news and media, that's often more useful. But if your favorite company's on there, you can look and go, wow, cool, Minnie's not number one. That's kind of cool. Who the hell's SNKN Games? What are they putting out that everyone's talking about? So it's, it's a good way to find information. So the other one you're going to have is, of course, the, the listing, the, the top list. So if you go to games, wherever, I don't even know where it is. It's up at the top now under board games and go all. You're going to see every game ever made, ranked, and so on. And Gloomhaven so is browse, still number game. one. That's what I'm like. Gloomhaven's yep. number one, Pandemic. Terraforming Mars recently bumped up. Terraforming Mars at number four is amazing. That surprises me. Like, yes, I think it's that good. I'm just surprised how many other people think it's that good. So this isn't a unique thing about Board Game Geek and hotly debated on their website. I don't know if I'm going to read every word of this, but the ranking on Board Game Geek, there are two, th there's a couple things. So first off, you rate things one to ten. Most people jump on there and rate games they love 10 and games they hate 1 and don't really pay any attention to the rating system. That personally drives me nuts. I personally think if there's a rating system there, you should use it. Now, at 
minimum, I think you should go one to ten and go, you know, an average game is a five and this is better than average. So it's a six or a seven or it's worse than average is a four or a three. Like that's better than just going games I like are nines and tens and the games I hate are ones and two. What I really wish people would do is actually follow the guidelines on Board Game Geek. I realize I'm asking a lot here, but please, if you do listen to our show, I appreciate it if you actually followed the actual ratings of this number. Because I like it, and the numbers mean something. Because one means it's not a game. There's very few games out there that are actually ones. I can't think of any off the top of my head. Masters um, of the Universe. LCR. Masters LCR. of the Universe should technically be a one, correct? No, that's, I'd say, is a two. Okay. It is a game. It's just an incomplete, unfinished, doesn't work game. So, number one, if, if you've ever played LCR, I don't get why people like LCR. All it is is you have chips, and you roll a die, and you put a chip either left, center, or right, depending on what the die saw, said. And then one of them is going to end up higher than the others, and that one wins. Like, I guess once you add gambling to it, I guess it's technically a game. So, one is it's, it's not a game. It, like some people have argued that some role playing games like uh, Fiasco is not a game. It's an improv experience. OK, I can at least see the argument. If you rate Fiasco a one, I kind of get it. OK, so but you shouldn't be rating Terraforming Mars one because you don't like it because it's definitely a game. You may not think it's a great game, but it's definitely a game. Like, come on, people. Next, very bad. Won't ever play it again. To me, this is the game. This is if you really hate Terraforming Mars. OK, you give it at least a two. Like, you'd have to really hate it, because number three is likely won't play this. There aren't many games that if my daughter came to me and said, can we play, play this, I'm going to say, no, that game's terrible. Or if I go to a game night, and there's only five of us, and the other four players want to play a game, even if I hate if they want to play Werewolf, I'll probably sit down and play Werewolf, if the other four people want to do it. Werewolf, I don't rate a two. I, I, it's a three, likely won't play this ever again. Or four, not so good, but could play again. I'm in there for Werewolf, right? I can't. I won't say I won't ever play Werewolf ever again. You know what? In the right circumstances, I could be convinced to play Werewolf. So your three is likely won't play this again. Your four is not so good, but I could play it again. A lot of games go in the four category for me. There's all your popular games your troubles your stories your monopolies like they're not that good but you know if with the right group maybe i'd play it again then you get to your fives it's kind of a boring game i could play it or never play it again i don't care there's a ton of games that fall in this category for me the perfect example is splendor i really wasn't overly impressed by splendor everyone seems to love it it's okay i'll i buy some chips we do this one of us is gonna win then we'll go play something else fine I, I I had some fun. I might have won. I might have lost. It's okay. That's splendor to me. Carcassonne's kind of fallen in there now, right? Like, it's I played it so many times. Like, yeah, I put some tiles out. I put some things. Oh, look, I completed a big city, right? Um, Kark may move up a bit because number six is we'll play it if in the right mood, which fits an awful lot of games. Like, even games like Pooh. I, there's a game. It's about monkeys throwing poo at each other, and you have 20 life points because once you're too covered in poo, you have to go away, and the last monkey standing wins. I just give that away to Extra Life this weekend. But you know what? I would have played that if in the right mood. Like, over the years, I've played Pooh a few times. It, it happened. There was that night where, like, oh, this will be funny. Let's play Pooh. Sure. I'll play it if in the right mood. Then we get up to the sevens. The sevens are usually willing to play. Of the thousand or so games I have downstairs, pretty much all of them I rate seven or higher because I'll play them. I'm usually willing to play them. Let's go. Let's play this. Let's play that. Then we get up to the eights. That's I will play it and will suggest other people will play it. Now listen to the difference between seven and eight. Seven is I'm usually willing to play. Eight is I'll suggest it. Like at that point, these are the games you own and your friends come over and go, hey, let's play this. More games should be rated 8, I would think, just because of that. And then we get into 9. That's always enjoy playing it. That's most really good games. Like, my top 20 is probably all rank 9. Maybe there's one or two, like, follow. I want to rank 9, but there's every now and then it just doesn't work. So I don't always enjoy playing it. But most of the time, I love follow. Uh, and then 10 is always enjoy playing and expect it will never change. I only have about 10 games that i have ranked 10 azul is one 
Like, I I don't think I'll, like, every now and then, okay, yeah, I played 20 games as well the last weekend. Maybe I don't want to play that 21st game. But overall, like, put it away for a day or two, and I'm like, okay, I'm good to go. Let's play again. So that's their rankings. So you would think that the games would be rated based on the average of all the users putting rankings in. But no, they do something funky. So what they do, the user ratings are used to determine the rank of a game in the database. Only games that have at least 30 user ratings are eligible. And they add a number of dummy ratings, which are then used to produce a new average rating. There's a whole thread on how this works. Now that's the rating that shows up on searches and the number can and often does vary from the actual average. So the effect of the dummy ratings move a game's average towards the norm of all games. We're talking all database stuff here, right? (laughs) So it makes games with few votes but very high ratings lower and games with tons of ratings but a lower number moved up a bit. So there's a whole process. It's called the Bayesian average that they use that system. There's secret undocumented stuff done to feature, to filter out shill or hate ratings, which obviously don't work for the number of times I see Terraforming Mars rated one because it used stock photos for their art because that affects your gameplay because notice nothing in the rating system says beautiful game or I love the way it looks. But people seem to take offense to the fact they use some stock images for some of the cards. Anyway, yes, I'm bitter about people who rate Terraforming Mars 1. Um, So then there's something weird where the number of dummy ratings changes depending on the total number of ratings. And this is there's a paradox that people talk about on the forum. Like if you want to dive into ratings on BoardGameGeek, there are so many threads about ratings on BoardGameGeek. It's, it's not. It's, it's interesting, and they do actually publish the standard deviation uh, on each game's ratings breakdown, so you can uh, look at the statistics. Uh, and again, as Mo said, only games with thirty ratings or more are listed. So while there are actually over a thousand pages of games in the ratings list, there's actually only sixteen thousand and uh, sixteen thousand two hundred and twenty-two games that are actually ranked. Uh, right. the, the final one being tic tac toe, uh, because uh, all the games beyond that. Um, so after after page one hundred and sixty three, all <laughs> the other games are unranked because they have not yet received the thirty games. So yeah, yeah. one thousand and twenty five pages of games, but only one hundred and sixty three pages of rankings with sixteen thousand two hundred twenty two ranked games. Um, that is. And, and, I, and I and I own almost played. I own almost all the games on the bottom ten. <laughs> <laughs> of course, because uh, well, a lot of that's hate yeah. drafting too, right? Every, I mean, everyone got, hates yeah. the, the, the shoots and ladders. Games. Shoots and ladders, Candyland, the game of life. So, trouble, so that's Monopoly, one of the ones. Shoots Operation. and ladders. Shoots and ladders. I actually rated a one. Same with Candyland because there was no decisions made whatsoever. You roll dice and you move on a thing. That's not a game. There, you. You don't do anything. There's not a single decision made. Candyland's worse. At least in Shoots and Ladders, you, it's random who's going to win. Candyland, as soon as you've shuffled the deck, you've predetermined who's going to win the game. So to me, that's you could. it's predetermined. It's not a game anymore. But anyway, um, Jeff in the chat room noted, asked if Twilight Strungle was number one forever. Yes, it was, which is what got me to buy it. So far, I have never agreed with a number one rating since Power Grid. So <laughs> Twilight Struggle is a very unique game. I don't see how it got to be number one. Though compared to Gloomhaven, they're really far apart. So it's interesting to see how the user base has switched from a much more war game card based focus to Gloomhaven, which is, I guess, still Warhammer, but it's grid map battle fantasy versus area control maps of the world. Um and he also notes they didn't know there were meanings of the ratings, which is why I'm here, why I'm trying to explain it. When you go to rate a game, there's a little question mark. If you mouse over that, it shows you what all the ratings mean. The other trick I've been told by people, though I haven't tried it myself, is you can do percent. Like you can give something a 9.8 by rating it like 9, then 10, 
uh, whatever nine times will actually give you a 9.8 rating. Or if you want like a 6.5, you rate it six, then you rate it seven. I haven't actually tried that trick. I just rate once. Uh, what do we got? What else we got to talk about? So oh, wait, wait, game wait. What is game what wait? Is so, game wait. I we think I'm going to wait for We talk about heavy. Oh, okay. Because we talk about heavy games all the time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so while we're talking about, you know, things, if you're looking at the page for a board game, because most people who aren't, uh, you know, the in-depth collector like yourself mm-hmm. probably aren't even going to have user logins for Board Game Geek. They're going to want to go and learn about a game. Mm-hmm. And, and for that, you're going to use it much the way I do, where you go to that front page and you go to their search bar and you type in the name of a game. Uh, and if you're lucky, it will pop up with what you want. Um, my, my problem with it is it's not very good at figuring out what you want if you don't know. So no, get you have your to spell the correct. name right. Um, and and try, try spelling laser riders. Yeah. <laughs> and then it also, um, there's so many games that have similar spellings. So mm-hmm. if you try and search for zombies, well, you need to figure out which spelling of zombies you're looking for in which game mm-hmm. and with an S or with a Z or, you know, whichever. But once you, once you have found the game page you want, um, most of the information you're going to start with is right up in that very top. It's, it's quite well laid out. The big uh, hex right there has got the, the ranking. So if you're looking at Arkham mm-hmm. Horror, uh, you know, your, your third edition right off the top of the hotness... It's an 8.2, and it's really easy to see, really easy to read. Yeah. Right away, you know what that ranking is. Uh, and then below that, you've got your number of players. Uh, and, and what that tells you is, uh, and Jeff was, you know, and, and uh, Angie Games were complimenting this earlier, the first number is what the box says. The box says mm-hmm. one to six players. But right below that, in smaller type, is what the community says. And this is what real people who really play the game say. Mm-hmm. You know, where in this one, it's two to four, which means they say yes. it's a one player game. Don't believe them. It's not. Mm-hmm. Play this with two to four people. Uh, yeah, it's then, one of the most useful yeah. functions on Board Game Geek. And then moving on, you've got player, playing time, which is, of course, a range. Uh, and then again, next we have age, which again, the same thing. You've got your age on the box, and then you've got the age that real people think you should play. Because you're... Your com- the game designers are always going to be held to a certain standard uh, with pieces and, and you know, the, the PR department, I think, makes that decision more than anyone else <laughs> in many ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas the community will come here and in this case say, yeah, yeah, if you're 10 years old, you can play Arkham Horror. It's not that big a deal. Uh, <laughs> and a, then, let, let's, let's, let's bring our 10 year old into some <laughs> existential crisis and sure. teach them about the Elder Gods. Uh, that, hey, that one seems a little questionable, but sure. I let, I let my I introduced my nine year olds to Cthulhu through Gra- Gravity Falls, so I'm good. All um, right. And then you've got your designer, your artist, your publishers, uh, and yeah. details. And then if you if you want to delve deeper, you can go down and you can dig into the weeds with all the other information they have, um, as as deep and as thorough as you want to go with forums and images mm-hmm. and. Um, I, I, I love that, you know, so many users post pictures of their copies of the game so you can really get a feel for what that game looks like mm-hmm. without having to deal with box art because we all know, I mean, yes. box art is like the, the McDonald's Big Mac photos, right? No one believes that's what you're going to get when you walk into a McDonald's and order a burger. <laughs> so Yeah, uh, the, to, to be honest, there's a growing number. I think this is a Kickstarter problem box art that is 3d renders of the components instead of the actual components that is becoming very common and very annoying i will generally not buy a game if that's all i can see or more likely what happens is i get contacted by someone saying hey tabletop bellhop do you want to review this and i'm like that's what you're sending me i don't want to take a chance on that because i don't like to review things negatively and you don't want me to put out bad press so that doesn't look like my kind of game if you want i'll review it but realize i may say bad things I and mean, at that point most people back off so but yeah that seems to be a growing problem but yeah there is a ton of information on each one like uh, like you can get to the forum so another aspect of board game geek that's huge is the fan created content so one of the things you'll find when you scroll down 
uh, very prominently now are video reviews. Board Game Geeks really pushed that. With the 2015 redesign, it's one of the things that now show up where you can actually see like the preview image just like you were on YouTube. And you can see video reviews almost instantly. And like Sean said, this is almost as good as people's pictures, right? You're going to get to see the game. Plus, hear someone's thoughts on the game all at once, which is pretty fantastic. Uh, the other thing you're going to find videos are is rules teaching. So no longer gone are the days you need to sit down and read a rule book. Lots of people out there will teach you how to play the games live on video if you are a visual learner. If you have to read it yourself, you can probably find a copy of whatever game it is, rule book, in whatever language you read. And you can probably find player aids and rule summaries and FAQs all created by the fans that are probably all more clear than the book that came with your game seems to be a common thing um you're gonna find faqs you're gonna find what is wrong with that game before you've even brought it home you're gonna if this existed back in the day i would not own lone wolf and cub because i would have learned on board game geek that there are missing pages in the rule book and the game is unplayable uh master of the universe role-playing game probably the same thing though i don't remember seeing if there was anything on there about it i know i went looking and no one has created host roles yet because that's what i was hoping for there is a ridiculous amount of content created for almost every game i'll admit it's not every game every now and then I grab some older game off my shelf and I go looking for like a rule summary sheet and I'm like, wow, no one's created one for this. I guess it's not very good a game because but anything popular, anything on the hotness, it's going to be there. And uh, another thing right at the very bottom of that list, uh, we were talking about geek lists earlier. Well, they do a list of geek lists with this game. So if you want to try and mm -hmm. find, you know, other players who like the same games as you, you can look at other people who've, who've put together lists uh, based on that game. Uh, and you might be able to find uh, good options to go with if you're looking for uh, something similar. Another one to know is you can click on the ratings and see what people have rated things. And that was something I thought we might talk about. I don't actually know Sean's opinion on this. There are a lot of people who think the board game rate geek ratings are be all end all. Like, they will only buy games that are rated 8.2 or higher, and they must have it in their collection. And then there are other people who think the entire thing is BS and don't pay any attention to it at all. Like, any rating system, yes, part of it is a popularity contest. What are your thoughts on rating systems? I mean, in some way, you have to have a rating system. Uh, but at the same point, you have to take it with a grain of salt. You know, I look at the I look at the the rating list, and again, I I have I have or have played almost everything at the bottom of the, <laughs> of the ranking list. Um, I've got a couple of kids. You know what? Playing I I like playing Operation every once in a while. I drink a lot of coffee. I'm really horrible at it. Um, <laughs> you know, I play tic tac toe in pretty much every restaurant on every child's yes. menu for you know ever. Um, Thank God they started putting those fill in the square uh, ones on menus now. Yes, so it's I like just those. something. That's a way better game. Yeah, Squares is way better than tic tac toe. It's, it's just something <laughs> different than than tic tac toe every time you go out to dinner. Um, but I play it and, and I don't mind it. I I like playing Monopoly every once in a while, depending on who you're playing with. There are some people I will not play Monopoly with. <laughs> um, and and the game of life is a fun one. I I remember that game fondly. My family used to play that regularly. Um, and they're not great board games for you know collectors, but they're a fun little family, uh, fun little family game. Uh, and no, Candyland is not a, a game, but if you're, you know, three years old or four years old, the kids love it because you get the themed one based on whatever they are. My daughter had the uh, Disney Princesses Candyland and she loved that go. game. Loved it. So, you know, it is what it is. Uh, but if you want to be a hardcore board gamer, you need a ranking system of some sort. You know, you can't, I mean, there has to be an, a, someone who to just say, say, this is better than that. Um, and everyone's going to still have their own opinion, but there also has to be something you can refer to. And whether it's Metacritic for video games or IMDb for, uh, you know, for movies or, you know, uh, Rotten Tomato or, mm -hmm. or Board Game Geek, um, there, there is a pl absolutely a place for a ranking system. Um, you know, whether or not, having this ranking system you, the way it is, because um, it's not just five is okay, 10 is great, and one is horrible. It, I, you know, I, I think that the, they might have uh, made some mistakes going with that, with that, <laughs> that way, um, because yeah. it, doesn't, it does skew the ranking. It's not, you know, uh, the, the standard deviation matters more because you're not, uh, it, you know, some people are using it properly and some people aren't. But, uh, but no, I, I absolutely think that it's, it's a valuable tool 
uh, as long as you remember that it's a tool and uh, it doesn't, uh, you know, change the world. I remember when uh, you first joined Board Game, well, not joined, but we're looking at Board Game Geek and we were talking about a couple games. Um, I can't remember how they came up. I think it was Twitter or something. Someone was talking about a game or someone had pitched me and we started researching a game. And they're like, oh, it's rated uh, 5.6. That's not bad. And I'm like, whoa, no. On Board Game Geek, 5.6 is, is pretty bad. Just to, to get used to how people use the rating. Like 5.6 means slightly boring, take it or leave it, or we'll play every now and then if in the right mood. Like that's not a good description of a good game I really want to play all the time. And I remember kind of telling Sean that in general for Board Game Geek, if I don't see at least a 6, I'm probably not going to pay any attention. Um, the only reason I would is because there's buzz. Like, so for me, hype and ratings go hand in hand or apart from each other. Like the two matter to me. Yeah. So if I see a board game geek rating of six, but every podcast out there is talking about how awesome it is. Um, I don't know the rating, but I'm going to take a rough guess here that happy salmon is probably in that six range because people love it or hate it. So then I have to listen to the people who are hyping it going, are these people whose opinion I share? So is the hype something I might be hyped about? And therefore, it's getting rated worse by people who are like, that's not a serious game. It's something you make lots of noise and annoy other people with. Uh, so it, now here's another thing. What is the difference between a geek rating and an average rating? So... I meant to mention that with the rating. So the average rating is the literal average rating. Everyone's rated it. It didn't average. The geek rating is that whole thing where they assign ranks with the fake uh, votes and their Bayesian average, whatever hoochie manuli they do in the back room. Because, 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 uh, yeah. So Happy Salmon has a six point nine average. Wow, with a six, higher than with, I thought. With a six point four geek. There, six point four. I figured around six five. It's so it's, it's a little higher than I would have thought. So average is what they actually show on that. So the, the the thing in the green hex is the average rating for the game. Whereas, I thought that was the geek rating. Weird. No, okay. apparently not. Because um, I'm just looking. I'm just looking at the uh, at the lists right now, and um, no, it's the average that's shown in the hex. Uh, the geek rating is only there in the rankings or in the search results. I, I don't okay. actually even really see any easy way to find the geek ranking outside of that. Um, so. See, this shows how uh, opaque <laughs> board game geek can be. So the one I like is if you click on the breakdown, you actually get to see how many people ranked it each. Mm -hmm. So just, just talking about people hate voting, okay? 235 people in the world think Gloomhaven deserves a one. Like, seriously? Um, go Habs Go! Says not fun, pure drudgery. No, that still doesn't defy still a doesn't game description. One, yeah. Generic, uninspiring setting, very repetitive scenario levels, dumb mechanics, ridiculous hype, disappointing. All valid points, but still sounds like a game. Like one, you won't ever play this again, so a three at least. Um, bad, clunky, fiddly version of Dungeons & Dragons. Yeah, kind of. Uh, pretty much every other dungeon crawl out there is better than this mess. Now I kind of want to see if Game Master Overlord rated another game like Dungeon, uh, dungeon Crawl Classics, for one. But Descent, I wonder how he rated that. Like, a one? Seriously, guys? Like, you're just mad that people are playing a board game instead of signing up for your D&D game. I think that's all that is. Anyway, so yes, you can click on the ratings to see them. But I generally will use the two, right? So if a game's like rated a nine point something, I'm like, wow, that must be good. But if I look and all the people who are talking about it are the heavy war gamers, maybe it's the best Hannibal Rome versus Carthage chip based game that takes 17 hours to play. I still don't want it. Or it's got a 9.8 and it says best social deduction game ever on every podcast I listen to. I'm not going to pay attention. Like to me, you need more than just the ratings, but yes, I will admit that unless it's rated about a six, I'm probably going to disregard it unless I've heard good things. I any saw, more, yeah. uh, just, any just, more, it's closer to a seven or an eight for me. Yeah. Just looking at, uh, you know, I, I was looking at Arkham horror because again, it's, it's top of the hotness right now. Yep, it's top of um, the hotness. So it's ranked in eight. It's, it's an 8.2 average rating. Yep. Uh, with 222 ratings, it is, Which is only, not a lot. It is only 2815th in the rank. Like it's in the yeah, but know. it's going to come up. It yeah. just came out this week. So no, absolutely, absolutely. But I mean, 
it's been I mean it's been sitting at the top of the hotness now for at least a, a week and a week week and a half. Um, but it's still in you know it's it's only in the top three thousand uh, games. Um, yeah, it's got its ones already. Uh, but there's an, an interesting of course. <laughs> there's an interesting rating. One of the most more recent uh, rating people is you know he explains himself at the top of his rating of his, of his comment and he says if I enjoy a rate game I give it a seven until I've had multiple plays. But so, so they, there is a system. Don't make up your own. No, but it that makes me nuts. But that, if I enjoy a game. I give it a seven, which is good, usually willing to play. Okay. So, you know, the first time he plays it. But he game, never rates anything higher than seven? No, no, he does. Until I've had multiple plays. Once he, 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 so basically, if he, if he sits down, plays a game, and likes it, he gives it a seven. And then he adjusts his ranking after he's given it multiple plays and, and determines okay. better. Fair enough, I guess. And then he, he went down to one? Uh, no, no, he's uh, he ranked oh, okay. he, he ranked it in eight five eight point five. Wow, yeah. So that's yeah. I guess he liked it. Um, I can't even bring up the edition of Arkham Horror because I can't find it. Uh, top of the hotness. To, yeah, that's <laughs> now, what I just did. One of the other the one of the other interesting things you should probably keep an eye on, or or at least you know, take a take a look at is, you know, if the these people who are rank, rating at a one, do they own it or have they owned it? Yes. Um, it's you know, if you see a whole bunch of people with ones and none of them show it as either owned or previously owned, mm, yeah, probably not worth paying attention to. Um, Some people put interesting things in the comments. Yes, they do. Anyway, I'm not going to sit here and <laughs> read through. I have a feeling that'll fly up. That's really not a lot of ratings for a new game. And I have a feeling it's going to slowly bump up to the top 100. But we'll see. I don't know how quick that happens. I know with some games it's been quicker than others. But like Terraforming Mars probably started at 5,000. Right. All right. Uh, we mentioned weight. So we'll talk a little bit of weight. I don't know how much I put into this one. Uh, this one seems more variable than ratings. So all it is is one is the game is light. Five is the game is heavy, and you get a rating from one to five. So it's light, medium, light, medium, medium, heavy, heavy. Most games seem to be in the threes. Like, everyone seems to think everything's around medium every now and then. The biggest thing is if anything's higher than four, it's usually a really heavy game. And if it's less than two, it's probably a family game. But that's about it. That middle ground seems to be all over the place. But weight is so subjective. Like, if you're brand new to board gaming... Um, and haven't played a lot. And a perfect example of this was at our launch party, Jazz, I think is his name. I think I'm getting this right. Thought Seven Wonders was the most complicated game he's ever seen. There were too many rules, too much going on. To him, that was a five. And I would think of Seven Wonders as like a two, maybe a 2.5 on a hard day. Now, the thing is, if Jazz kept coming out and playing games with us every Saturday, eventually Seven Wonders would be that simple game, and he'd be going, wow, Food Chain Magnet, that blows my mind, that's a five. And that tends to happen with everyone who joins this industry, unless they decide they like the light party games, which happens, which is perfectly cool. Some people don't want to play heavy games. But I've noticed most people like a bit more strategy, and then they get into it, and they learn games like Catan, and then they want the next step, and then they're playing some Terra Mystica, and then they want the next day, and they just keep evolving to more heavier games, while still often playing filler games, but they start to enjoy the heavier games more. And the more game mechanics you know, the more the simpler it gets. Like, if you look at Ascension and you're like, oh, this just combines deck building with set collection and has a bit of resource management. I know what those three things are because I played a bunch of other games. You're like, wow, Ascension's just Dominion with a couple new things. And it's better than Dominion because it does a couple new things and I like these new things. And then you throw that into Great Western Trail. So now the deck building's like this little minor thing and you're doing this whole moving on the board, right? Like it's so hard to determine the weight of a game. And, and, what I think is a heavy game is going to be completely different than what Sean thinks is a heavy game, which is going to be completely different than what my 10-year-old daughter thinks is a heavy game. For her, Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunters is up there, right? Whereas Monster Factory is down pretty low, right? But that's her scale. Those are the games she's played. Actually, Mice and Mystics for her is probably the heaviest game she's played. And Seven Wonders ranks out at a 2.3. So, yeah, that's, that's about where I would put it in, yeah. in the twos. 
So yes, you do have board game alpha gamers, whatever you want to call them. Like that's the thing with board game geek, right? The people you got to think about who uses the site, right? The average person on the street's not going to board game geek. It, it's people who have basically Googled the board games they own for one reason or another is what's going to lead you there. Or they already listen to gaming podcasts and hear people like us talking about board game geek all the time because it is a fantastic resource. Then you got to think there's a level above that, the people who are willing to create an account. They obviously care a little more, so they're going to be more invested in the site, and they're probably more invested in the hobby. Their hobby is probably something they take very seriously that's possibly more important than their work life or their home life. Who knows? They're probably more invested. But then you go another step up, and the users who are willing to not only register for the site, but actually go and log their plays and put what games they own and rate them. So now you're a step up. So once you're looking at the ratings, you're already at the gamers who have chosen. They found the board game geek. They've created a account and they've logged all their games to rate them they care that much and then it goes further right then like i don't log weight when i put play games it's not something i tend to do but people who put in the weight the people who put in the average number of players the people that put in um what's the other one we were talking about number of players game link that's another one we should have touched on this is an important, awesome resource for Board Game Geek because, wow, you can never trust how long it says the game is going to be on the box, ever. Like, no one gets this right. I'm pretty sure if you had the designer with his playtesters that played the game a thousand times sitting down to play the game, they still probably couldn't finish it in whatever that shortest time period is. Just, I don't know where they get these numbers. It, it's Again, I think it's marketing. Where, like, either... either Companies like, we have to put out a game that can be played in less than an hour, and it plays two, or the opposite. We need a big, epic game, so we're going to say it's played in three hours, but actually it plays six. Like, they go both ways. So, Board Game Geek has a listing for the average amount of time, and it is almost bang on for your average group. When I run tournaments in Windsor, and I need to fit so many games in a nine hour time slot that's what i use to get the times i add 15 minutes to the board game geek time to get time for set up and put away and i have so far only had about two games run over time and that's usually a player problem or a rule misunderstanding problem so the times on board game geek are fantastic it's great to use that naked hairy dude hoodie Yes, Board Game Geek. Board Game Geek is ad-supported. This is something I used to use my Geek Gold for when I went there all the time. It's one of the things you can do is turn off ads by using the Geek Gold you earn on the site. Ways you can earn Geek Gold. Um, I used to get it mainly by putting up reviews. I used to put my board game and my role-playing reviews on Board Game Geek. Mainly so I would get that Geek Gold so I could turn off ads because I use the site a lot more. I don't use that site as much. I get most of my gaming news now through podcasts. I do use Board Game Geek, but not the way I used to. It's not my source for news. It's where I go to look up specific things on specific games. Or when researching articles for Tabletop Bellhop, like um, when I was looking at the game mechanics, I wanted to see what Board Game Geek listed as game mechanics. Or I often use their geek list when looking for things like popular two-player games and popular solo, what was it, co-op kids games and other rather niche topics we've looked at. So we've been talking for a while. Um... I don't know. Do you have anything else for Board Game Geek? Anything else you think is worth sharing? I think it's really, I mean, if you're just starting off, uh, really what you want to do first is just, you know, ignore most of that front page. Uh, look at the yeah. hotness. See what people are talking about. Um, I, would, I would say even not look at the geek buzz because a lot of that is new stuff and some of it no, isn't that's... out yet. Uh, you know, a mm -hmm. lot of that's, you know, stuff from, from Germany that's, that's going to be coming out. Look at the hotness to see, you know, what people are talking about, what's really hit in right now, and then go straight to that search bar, search games you have or games you've heard about, games you're, game, you know, games you're interested in, and look at those pages and, and try to understand a little bit. Don't delve too deep uh, because mm -hmm. like any forum or public content site on the internet, there are depths which you don't necessarily want to go in, go to. Um, there, it has its uh, YouTube commenter sort of depths that, that you just don't mm -hmm. need to deal with. And if you are deeply invested and you have deep, powerful feelings about games and you can wade into those depths, feel free to. Uh, but uh, be, wo be warned that there are, uh, there may be dragons, there are trolls. <laughs> um, and, 
all is not happy the deeper you, you delve in. Um, there are people who feel very, very strongly about things and are not afraid to voice their opinions. So, you know, start yeah. off start off light and happy. Read about the games, look at the designers. <laughs> if there's a game you like and you love the way it looks, hop in there, look at the artist, look at the designers, and see what else they've put out. Because odds are, if the art it means a lot to you, you'll find something else they've done that you like. And uh, you may even find the, them on there. They, and they may be posting about upcoming things they've got. Mm-hmm. So yeah, Sean Sean makes a good point. So we we're I was talking about levels, like people who get more invested, right? Like the the alpha gamers. So you got to think about the people who now have added games. They've tried to add new content. They've commented on everything. They put up their own rules video. They've got their opinions on the game. There are portions of Board Game Geek I would go as far as to say are toxic. Uh, there are people who think the hobby is theirs and their way of interacting with the hobby is the only way anyone should interact with the hobby. And every bit of gatekeeping you see in the video game industry or any other industry is just as bad. And Board Game Geek is kind of the front line for that. So like Sean says, if you dive deep enough, you will find these people. Uh, if that's your thing, if you like arguing with gatekeepers there's tons of them there to argue with but like if you want to see it all you have to do is go to the hot deal site and put on a deal that's not that hot and you will probably have about 20 people jump on your thread report you to the mods for spamming and ev- call you literally nasty names just for saying something's five cents cheaper in, in it sorry it's five cents more than it was yesterday because the deal was hot yesterday and now it's not like it's crazy I literally avoid most of the forums on Board Game Geek because of this. Um, try going into any of the game forums and offering up a house rule. Wow. Like, you, you want to see something blow up. Have you tested that a thousand times? If you haven't tested a thousand times, you don't know what kind of... Like, it, it's, it can be bad. Um, sadly, I also have to say that you may wish to hide your gender if you are not a cis white male and you are on Board Game Geek. Sadly, a problem with our community overall, and it can be a problem on Board Game Geek. Their moderators are fantastic. There are people that will defend you, but you will also get a ridiculous number of private messages offering every helpful service in the world because you happen to be the opposite gender of the standard user base. So yes, uh, but as Sean mentioned, that's pretty much the dark side of every forum and everywhere else on the internet. It's just Board Game Geek is part of the net and has those type of netizens just like anywhere else. Yep, you can't, uh, you know, the the only reason there hasn't been a Gamergate in board games yet is because no one's made it big news yet, I think. I I think it has been there. I think it has happened. Uh, There's probably a significant amount of it uh, that exists in the community we just mm-hmm. uh, it just hasn't come to the forefront because there isn't as much coverage of board game as there is video games. Uh, there isn't as much money in board games as there is video games yet. No, um, but it's it's a matter of time. Uh, it will it will come out. Um, it will hit, and there will be fallout, and it's just a matter of people who you know people who were made you know. The internet was created by cis white males, and uh, they think they own it, and uh, they have they have to be shot down one at a time. Sadly enough, just don't shoot all the cis white males. <laughs> that that would suck for you guys. You wouldn't get to listen to us anymore. We're not all bad. There we go. <laughs> we do our best to be as inclusive as possible. Yes, we try. Still learning. I do make mistakes now and then. I'll always try to say folk on a map, though. <laughs> I want to ring that again. We record our show live on Twitch, and we encourage people to drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby. Thanks to our moderator, Angie Games. Tonight, Jeff and uh, Angie Games were talking about using Google to search on Board Game Geek as better than using their on site search bar. <laughs> you can type the acronym BGG plus game title, and the BGG page will come up, which is much more forgiving with spelling variations. I, I have to say that it's like a metaphor for the entire board game geek interface right there, that it is easier to Google search using BGG as a tag than actually go on board game geek. Like I didn't even get into RPG geek, right? So here's something we didn't talk about. RPG geek tried to be smart because role playing games are more complicated than board games. And I don't mean this in a rules complexity in the fact that if you say dungeons and dragons, you could be talking about 
like a ridiculous number of things. So the way they set it up is more object oriented, right? So you have your main object is Dungeons and Dragons. And under that, you have sub objects. You have OD and D, you have AD and D, you have AD and D second edition, you have, and so on, right? So D and D being a great example, because I think there's 13 different versions of D and D out there. It's something like that. It's crazy. There really are that many because there's like skills and powers is considered its own edition. So under that though, you also then have core rules. So you have your monster manual player's handbook, dungeon master's guide. Then you have something like oriental adventures. Is that a core rule book or is that a splat book? And then you have splat books and you have adventures. So if you go on RPG geek and you want to try to find, like if you want to log a play, you're like, well, you could say I played D and D or I can say I played a D and D second edition, or I can say I played a D and D second edition skills and powers, or I can say I, I played the complete thieves handbook like what are you what are you actually looking for right and so they have their set set up so you can search for rpg or rpg item and that's the secret to using rpg geek is change the search drop down to rpg item before you search and you'll tend to get what you're looking for more often but as far as logging plays, like what I usually do is I search for the IPG item being the module we just played, and then I'll log that play, and then I'll find the family it's part of and log that as a play. But like everyone does it different, and oh my god, and same deal with Board Game Geek, everything has a forum. So if you want to go talk about 5th Ed D&D, you could do it on 5th Ed D&D, you could do it on Dungeons & Dragons, you could do it on Dungeons & Dragons OGL, or you could do it under the Player's Handbook, Dungeon Master's Guide, or any book they've ever published for 5th Edition Dungeons & Dragons. So trying to find that chat about that elf and what's a better way to build it and should you use two-weapon fighting or bow specialty, good luck trying to find where someone's talking about that on rpg geek and it's probably in 20 different places and all would have different suggestions so if you think board game geeks bad rpg geeks worse but what i will say is the rpg geek for some reason seems less venomous as far as their user base they're much more welcoming i don't know if that's to say a difference between hardcore board gamers versus hardcore role players but on rpg geek i have never been shot down for having a wrong opinion so I've always had, I enjoy the forums a lot more. I actually interact on the forums on RPG Geek and actively avoid the ones on Board Game Geek. Good to know. So anything else came up in the chat? Like most of it, I think we talked about as we were going. It's not very busy tonight, but I know it's not one of our regular nights, so we don't have our usual followers. I do welcome Jeff for joining us. I thought I saw someone else in there. Steve D was with us at one time as well. And Steve D, I do have to thank. He gets his his, his formal shout out tomorrow, but he is now a patron of the show. So thank you, Steve D. Absolutely. Uh, Jeff was saying he wished he had Arkham Horror at ten years old. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I gotta admit, at eight, at eight, I was getting into RPGs. I don't know. I think it was 1984 when I bought Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. So I guess that if I was going to do the Chaos Gods versus Cthulhu, yeah. so. 84, I was, what, 9? So, yeah. I think it was 84 I bought that. I had to, I'd have to Google. See, I should go on. There's something else. Here's something I use Board Game Geek for. The time when games came out and RPG Geek. I can quickly find out when Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay was first released. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, Which I I'll find, save for. And I find, you know, personally for me, uh, just because I don't have the collection nor the, the uh, encyclopedic knowledge of games you do, uh, you know, it's it's great for me to be able to talk about some of these games I may not have have, uh, have played, uh, but you know, sitting down with Board Game Geek, I feel like I know that game uh, by the time mm-hmm. I, I've gone through that page, and I feel like uh, you know, I ha- I have something to add in on a game that I haven't otherwise touched. Oh, it's very good for that. So, 1992 Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay came out, but what actually I was thinking of was Warhammer Fantasy Battle. Right. Would have been my first Warhammer game bought at the Silver Snail in Toronto, Ontario, mm-hmm. which would be under Board Game Geek because it's a miniature game. Oh. That's the other thing is trying to figure out where stuff is sometimes. There's a good indicator from Master of the Universe. That should have been the first thing that told me is it was on Board Game Geek, not RPG Geek, when I found oh, it the first time we go. and had to go buy a copy. And yet again, I warn everyone, don't do it. It's bad. <laughs> All right, uh, I can't spell Warhammer. See, this is like people said. If I typed that into Google, that would have worked. There we go. Uh, yeah, no, it's interesting. Uh, and you can integrate Google into your, your site. And I, 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 I assume it's because they don't want to give up advertising revenue that they've gone with their own search engine rather, I, than, rather than Google's. That's sort of the only thing I can think of. Ooh, um, no. I'm sure, there's, I'm sure there's some 
add cost. Oh man, there are there are a bunch of micro badges for Warhammer. I have to add some. So one of the amusing things on Board Game Geek under your name, you get these little tiny icons. Like they're small, like I don't know, twenty eight pixel by twenty eight pixel, and it's it's one of those you you know you're a a, a real user if you take the time to actually set your micro badges right. there was a time where i changed them every week so now i you get like three free every year at christmas they give out free ones and i'm like oh cool there's like i can get i can get the warhammer fantasy battle empire and the warhammer fantasy battle orcs geek bad or what do you yeah wow you have a <laughs> lot have of micro badges <laughs> yes <laughs> your, your that's contest, i've been using it for a long time yeah your contest official list is especially uh well, that's every time you enter a contest, they give you one, right? So that's those were free. Most of the other ones I actually picked. Okay, how do I versions? There are 12 versions of Warhammer Fantasy Battle. There's 8th edition. Where is the original? 1985. I was off by one year. Damn, I was close. No, English? Yeah, I was off by one year. So there you go. I was 10. So I was 10 when I was introduced to the Chaos Gods. So I guess you can introduce your 10-year-olds to, to the Elder Gods. Go. It's all good. <laughs> all right, totally off topic, though it did kind of come up in the chat, so we were talking, kind of talking about it. All right. Well, this was a great talk, but if you'd like to read more on topics like this, be sure to make sure uh, check out our blog at tabletopbellhop.com. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift is coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock the front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. A big shout out to our Patreon patrons. They help make this show viable. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletop bellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern. Watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Live. Take your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. We'd like you to, to invite you to hang around and join us in the penthouse suite for an off-the-books after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on. <laughs>